Hello, I'm Pastor Brian, and I want to thank you so much for joining me as we look into God's Word to see His timeless truth. What causes anxiety within you? What causes that stirring up of, I can't control it, I, I don't want to deal with it, I, I just get anxious? Maybe it is some of the things that have been dealt with this past year and a half, whether it be with COVID and sickness, not being able to control things. Maybe it's really maybe government and shifting of government and just wondering where things are going to go. Maybe it is with family members that you don't know how to talk with them or engage with them. Maybe it happens to deal with finances. What are things that keep you up in the middle of the night because you're anxious about them? And really, what 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 does the Bible say about how to deal with anxiety? What does the Bible say as really some of the causes of that anxiety? We're going to go ahead and we're going to look at that in 1 Peter chapter 5 in the very last part of it as we look into God's word kind of wrapping up 1 Peter as he continues to go through to strengthen believers and following after him because God has the best plan for us. And as he has the best plan for us, we need to trust in him. So before we go any further, let's go ahead and go before the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the truths that are in Scripture. Lord, I pray that as we look into your word, that you would help us to really evaluate what you give us so that we aren't anxious, so that we continue to trust in you as we go through suffering, knowing that you desire for us to grow closer to you. It's in your name we do pray. Amen. So here we are in the last part of 1 Peter. And 1 Peter, really in wrapping up, is kind of going to summarize everything and point believers, as I believe throughout the book of 1 Peter, our letter uh, that, uh, here, where he is pointing believers to grow in maturity and what it looks like to be a mature believer in Jesus Christ. So what your identity is, where your hope should be focused, understanding the world around you, and understanding suffering, knowing that each and every one of us goes through suffering. So turn to 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 5. Even though last week we looked at verse 5, it really kind of fits into both areas and is going to help us to understand uh, just kind of the following information. So let's go ahead and look at it again. Likewise, and so he's continuing on going as he has just talked about um, individuals submitting to elders and, and really that they are responsible to act in a proper manner and gave three ways in which elders were supposed to go ahead and, and where their motives should be, where their heart should be. And now he's calling all of us to trust in God. And that's really where we need to be as we suffer, as we go through difficulties and hardships, is that we need to be trusting in God. We need to be understanding that God uses suffering to draw us closer to himself. And that is important. In fact, throughout life, we, we put importance on a lot of different things. And a lot of the things that we put value in really don't deserve the value that we put on them. When ultimately, above all else, we should value glorifying God, knowing that we can trust him. And so that's really where Peter is going to come in in this passage, is talking about trusting God and helping us work through just the different trials in life. And he wants to set us up so that we can be walking with him and not and really being a witness to those that are around us and that we don't falter. So it says this. It says, likewise. So in the same manner that he has been talking as far as giving encouragement to the congregations, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. So uh, younger and elders, uh, so it could mean a number of different things as far as, is he talking about elders as far as those in the leadership position? Maybe not here because he's talking about those that are younger 
And, and I think he's talking about those who are mature in the Lord, those who are, are, are seeking wisdom from God and following after God. So be subject to, to them. And, and also he had talked about uh, being subject to the elders. And that's really a hard thing because what do we have to do when we are younger? Sometimes the ways in which we think are wrong. And those who have gone before us and are walking in the Lord really can give us guidance and direction. And it takes, a, it takes humility to say, all right, I may not have all the answers. Somebody else has the answers, and I'm going to trust in them. Just as we walk in life and the world comes and bombards us with things, uh, not only does the world, our own desires takes us off path, and as well as uh, Satan goes ahead and tries to distract us. We need to, in a sense, say, all right, I trust in God that he has the best plan for uh, plan for me, plan for you. If you're a believer, he has the best plan. Well, ultimately for everybody, but those who trust him desire to follow after him and to know him. And so he says this, he says, close yourselves, all of you. So he's talking about everybody. And this clothing is almost the same type of it's word that is used when Jesus goes ahead and wraps a towel around him as he washes his disciples' feet, as he's showing humility, as he's uh, humble and, and really caring for his disciples. So we are likewise supposed to clothe ourselves with humility, that we are supposed to follow after Christ examples, and, and, and I love how it just, uh, all of you, with humility towards one another. So it's a mutual humility that we say, all right, we may not have all the answers, but we're going to go ahead and we want to work together as a church, as a body of believers, because Peter has uh, several times come through the book of First Peter and says, here, your love covers um, a multitude of sins, and that we are called to love one another in the body of Christ. And as we're called to do that, we're called to uh, walk in humility. And then he reinforces that, the idea of humility, and, and really puts an emphasis on it, as he's going to restate it in a couple different ways. And he quotes Proverbs 3.34, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So when we get prideful, God says, I'm going to oppose that. That is not a characteristic. That, that is something I, I go against. And so as a believer, you don't want God going against you. You want to be uh, God to look at you and to show you grace, to show you mercy. And he says the way in which to do that is to submit to him. To, he wants, we want him to give us grace. And so we are going to be humble. Now, uh, being humble isn't thinking uh, less of yourself, self, but thinking less of, of yourself. So the idea of uh, not belittling yourself, uh, beating yourself up, saying, oh, I'm no good or anything like that, but caring about others around you, thinking about how can, instead of thinking about how can I meet my needs, how can I feel, fulfill my desires, you're looking to serve others. So you're thinking less of yourself and more of others. And so uh, he continues on, if he, this point hasn't gotten taken hold yet, he says in verse six, humble yourselves. And he's going to give the, the way in which to do this. The call really throughout all of scripture is that we would walk humbly with our God. And Israel had failed to do that. The Jews had failed to do that time and time again. And if you're honest with yourself, you would have to admit that at times you fail to do that. You, you feel like, all right, I can, I can control it. I can deal with it. I don't need anybody's help. And he's saying, no, you need to be humble, knowing that uh, I ultimately God is in control of all things. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, 
so that at the proper time he may exalt you. So what we have when it talks about the mighty hand of God, it refers essentially back to Genesis and and where it talks about the mighty hand of God and and delivering the, um, the, the Israelites out of the hands of the Egyptians and just talking that God is in control of all things. He can deliver us from captivity. And ultimately, that is what God has done. He has delivered us from the captivity of sin and death by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. And so it comes back here and says, humble yourselves because God is in control of everything. Trust him. Now, the world and things around us would say, don't trust in God. God doesn't have your best. In fact, that's the lie in the garden that he tries to get with Adam and Eve and they fall for it. And so this is a reminder by by Peter saying, this is what you need to be focused on. Knowing that you're aliens, you're strangers, is to uh, understand that God is in control and you will be going through suffering. But God ultimately is using uh, that suffering so that you would trust and depend upon him. So uh, the call is to trust in him. Nothing is outside of the power of God, and we need to trust that he has a plan. And so in that plan, it's future-oriented, and that's what we've been seeing all the way throughout First Peter, that he may exalt you. Uh, What a promise this is, that God keeps his promise, that he wants to carry you through this. There there will be suffering, but in the end, he will lift you up. And any suffering you go through now is not, is incomparable to the glory that you will have. So walk forward faithfully with him. Don't shrink back. Don't compromise on the gospel. Seek after God. And and this is the way in which he says or helps us. It says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. This idea of casting uh, uh, your anxieties on him is the idea of ca- like casting a net, throwing it out there and, ex- and, and knowing that when you pull back in that net, there will be a bountiful amount of fish. So uh, when we cast our cares, we are saying, I understand that I I can't deal with it, but the God of the universe that has raised Jesus Christ from the dead has dealt with it. He has taken care of it, and he cares about you. He cares more about you than the grass of the fields or the lilies or, 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 or the birds of the air. God cares for you. And so knowing of his great love for you, his love so much that he sent his one and only son to die on the cross for for you, then his death has paid the penalty of sin and death. What else should we do? It's by faith that we come into a relationship with Jesus. And it's by faith in him that we continue to walk in faithfulness, following after God, knowing that he cares for us. And so we're called to cast our cares uh, upon him. And then Peter, knowing, having failed, having had difficulties, and we can just see throughout the Gospels where Peter has fallen in many different ways in the sense of he he missed keeping his eyes on Jesus. He, He denied Jesus. He, he understands what it means to, to falter, but God still uses them. I mean, we, I think that's where we read in First Peter and just read as a mature believer of, of Peter just uh, by, by God giving us his wisdom that we can walk in maturity with him. So it says, be sober-minded. Don't be drunk. Be aware. Understand. Uh, Pay attention to what's going on around you. It says, be watchful. So sober-minded and watchful. So there's an engagement that we have to do. We can't be caught off uh, unaware. Um, we, We need to be 
sober. We need to have clear thinking and watchful. We need to have our eyes out looking for something. And this is what he says that we need to have our eyes looking out for. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So he, he takes the adversary, the devil, Satan, who is real. And I think it's important not to put uh, no emphasis on it. Satan is real, but also don't put too much emphasis on it. And, and what we see is that we see that God is in control. So we resist the devil in the fact that we trust in Jesus. We trust in God and his work. We cast our cares uh, upon, our anxiety uh, uh, upon Jesus, knowing that he cares for us. And therefore, as we're aware, we understand that the, uh, that Satan acts like a lion. And so what we see is this whole idea of prowling. So sneaking up on us, keep trying to catch those who are unaware, and, and then he's going to pounce on them. And so what we have are two things. I, I think we have the, uh, as people get distracted by the things of this world, and in fact, the warnings in which we are, we see things are, we've got to watch out for the world around us, our own desires, and the devil. And so here he's focusing on the devil, and it says, so that prowling, sneaking up on you, but also uh, roaring, and that, and that idea of roaring, a lion's roar is really loud, and, and, and it's meant to intimidate you, to scare you, and you can say, I'm not going to be afraid. I don't have to worry because I'm trusting in Jesus, who is more powerful than Satan. Satan can't do anything without God allowing it to happen. And so God is overall, God is in control. So trust in God. And and our part is to be uh, sober-minded, to be awake, and, and to be saying, we trust in you. We, we, anything that might cause us to be anxious, we're going to give that over to, to God because we know he can deal with it. And so we're not going to be taken. And so we are going to resist him. And that's what it talks about right here in verse 9. Resist him. And we're resisting him by trusting in God. Firm in, in your faith. And so that's what it talks about. Firm in your faith by trusting him, by standing firm, by having our, 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 our feet grounded in the word of God, knowing God, walking closely with God. And when we do that, when Satan tries to, to come upon us, take us out uh, by, by prowling upon us or, or trying to scare us, we can say, I'm not afraid because I'm I know the Lord, and the Lord is good and he's gracious. He has shown me more grace than I deserve. He will continue to show me grace, and he has a reward for me in heaven. So I am not going to miss out on that reward by being uh, taken away, by being scared uh, to follow Jesus, because I know that ultimately uh, God is the victor. And in this, he says this, and I think he says, as, as he's talked about it, is a community of believers, and he'll, he'll explain this even further as we get along. He says this, it says, uh, resist him, stand firm, knowing uh, in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood through the world. So you're not alone. Other believers in Christ are going through this. I have delivered them. I have delivered them in the past. I continue to deliver those. People continue to trust in Jesus, and he is worthy for us to put our trust in. It says, and after you have suffered a little while, and so this suffering and this little while, how long? Well, only till we're on this earth and then for all of eternity, no more sickness, no more death. So however long you are here, then God will deal with it. And so whatever our lives is, how many ever years we have left, it is, it is but a vapor. It isn't very long. 
And so the suffering is just a little while. The God of all grace. So all that you have, the ability even to resist the devil, uh, which he has given you and has entrusted you to, you to follow, uh, follow after the calling that he's given you, all of this has been given by God, and he has graciously given you gifts. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the, the God gifting us and us using that to God's glory. He has given us all things. And he calls uh, who has called you to his eternal uh, glory in Christ uh, will himself restore you. So it's Christ who does the work. God is going to restore us and uh, confirm and strengthens and establish you. So Jesus is the one who has done the work. We need to trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Just as when you trusted in what he did on the cross daily, as the gospel is, we're reminded of it every single day, that it's by him that we can walk in faith. And so don't get discouraged, don't go away, but continue to trust in him. He is the one who will help you when you are suffering. He's going to comfort you. He's going to give you strength. He is, he is going to be the one who helps you that 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 as we know who we are in Christ that we can continue in that manner and then he kind of uh, just at the end kind of continues just to say this is great and glorious as he wraps it up and says to him be dominion forever and ever amen so he, I think what we see is uh, we think about David and his kingdom that will not end. We see that fulfilled in Christ. We see that God is victorious. His dominion never ends. There is victory in Christ. There's, uh, we don't have to be afraid of the devil. We resist him. We know that God is there and, and he has, uh, can nothing will overtake us if we trust in him and we tr and through the suffering even though we go through it it's to draw us closer to God that we trust in him that we grow in maturity knowing the victory has already been established that God has won and to that we agree that you know this amen in, in agreement that God is Lord over all and that we can trust in him so if you're having doubts if you're going through uh, times of you're feeling anxious I want to encourage you that that other brothers and sisters have gone through this as well. Just as back then, we have people, you have people around you who can help you through these difficulties. Those anxieties that you're dealing with can help you realize the attack from the enemy can, can help reorient you back to Jesus, to trusting in him, to seeking after him. And so to do that because he is victorious. And then he wraps it up. He says, uh, by Sylvanus, and, and that is probably the same as Silas, uh, a faithful brother who I regarded him. So, he, so he's saying, all right, this is somebody, uh, he's close friend, trust in him. I, I trust in him uh, and, and even this, and he's probably even helped with this. Uh, I've written uh, briefly to you exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So this is the word of God. Stand firm. Be sober-minded. Uh, be watchful. Know that what he... First Peter, in First Peter, what Peter's telling us is this ha is how you walk in with Christ, with maturity, and this is what you're supposed to do. Uh, stand firm, knowing that Christ has already uh, been victorious, that he has uh, promises to give you blessing, so follow after him. Don't miss out on that reward, and, and be faithful not wavering, standing firm, submitting yourself, walking in humility as he has called us. And it says this. This is a little tricky right here. It says, She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. And so 
what it says when it's talking about Babylon, you think about Babylon uh, through scripture, it's often referred to uh, people that were rebelling against God, not being humble. And so we look at that and it says, she who's in Babylon. So oftentimes when we think about churches and we see churches referred to in, in scripture, it's referred to as a, a she. So it probably is a church in Rome that you're saying, all right, I have a, this has been established. I want to encourage you with that which is going on, the church that is in Rome, and, and, and they send greetings to you. And so he's probably using the word Babylon to maybe cloak the idea that he's talking about the church in Rome because he doesn't want the Romans to read this letter and then go after this church, although they will go through suffering. I think he's just kind of indicating that Look around you. There are others that are suffering. And, and, and not only that, these are my close friends. I've, they're out there. They can help. Uh, they're proclaiming the gospel and all of this. So so look to them. And then Mark, he, he says, my son, uh, I really just think he's talking about uh, John Mark. Uh, really a close friend, uh, somebody has, he sees as, as, as his son, somebody younger that he cares for. Greetings one another, greet or it says greet one another with the kiss of love. So if you think about just kissing, you're probably talking about kissing on the cheek, and and when that happens, I, I don't know if you've been in cultures where they do that, or, or you have some people you do that with. Those are people that you're close to in the sense of you're very vulnerable when, when you're doing that. And so you trust them. You walk with them. You're happy to see them. You rejoice with them. You cry with them. You go through suffering with them. And so as, as we walk as a body of believers, we need one another. And in all of this, as we go through suffering, that's God's plan that we have others around us that can help us, can, that can remind us of the truths in the, that are in, are in scriptures. And it says, it wraps up this way, peace to all of you who are in Christ. So those who have trusted in Christ, may the peace of God be with you. May you rest in, in Christ, knowing that he is the true victor over all, trust in him, walk with him, be humble, knowing that it's not about you, but it's about the work that Christ has already done. Trust in him. And really, I think somebody uh, pointed out just as, as he summarizes all of this, as we've been looking through First Peter, he, somebody says it this way, the only way to fight pride in Satan is the gospel. How true that is. To, 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 to go through this world, to, to walk in, in victory, we can't be prideful in ourselves because we know if it was left up to us, we'd go into sin, we, we'd stumble, uh, we, we would uh, follow Satan's path, we would we'd go down the wrong road, but just as we have trusted in Christ for our salvation, we continue to trust in Christ as we walk forward, going through suffering, knowing that there is a hope that is before us, knowing that there is a great reward to those who are faithful and to continue to pursue after Christ. So what an encouraging letter as we look through and we can see, yes, the sufferings that we go through, hard and difficult, but that is an opportunity to trust in, in Jesus and to rely upon him as we go through it. But, but don't do it casually. Be actively engaged, resisting the devil, trusting in Jesus, placing our faith in him, walking in humility because of we're in pride, that God opposes that and he knows that he should be opposed to that because that's what which takes us away from him. So trust in him. Walk with him. Know that God is good. So let's go ahead and close in prayer, knowing that we, we need to trust in him and he is the one who we should cast our anxieties upon, knowing that he cares for us. Lord, we thank you for the love that we have in you. 
We thank you that we can trust in you, that we can walk with you. Lord, I pray for anybody that's out there that is struggling with anxiety and is um, being distracted, being taken away um, by Satan as he seeks to to pounce on them, to, to scare them, that they would resist, that they would turn to you, that they would trust in you, Lord, who has overcome, who has defeated uh, the enemy on the, by sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. Lord, help us to continue to pursue after you, to trust in you. It's in your name we do pray. Amen. Thank you so much for taking the time. If you have any questions, reach out to me and be blessed.